Hello and welcome to Art East. This is the fifth edition of the festival where we try and link migration, art, livelihood and displacement. And as the title of this year's festival suggests, please tell us a story. Story connects the humankind and must we not then celebrate stories. In February last year, when we organized the fourth edition of Art East on language, Bhasha, the global pandemic was within striking distance, but not yet a reality. Then the world order suddenly changed, touching almost every human life, every family. Life and livelihoods were upended. People were forced into a virtual living. Amongst the worst who were hit were art and artists. Artists 2021, this uh, edition is a virtual festival and it invokes art as storytelling and showcases a slice of traditional folk craft and art and contemporary art as well that were originally storytelling rituals with a visual and performative aspect that over time uh, became a practice in many places. Many such practices today, you know, suffer from pressures of the market, uh, commercialization and lack of patronage and support. This, therefore, is an effort to revive our interest through an understanding and reinterpretation of art that tells a story. I hope all of you had an opportunity to go uh, to take a tour of the virtual gallery that was set up beautifully by Ashima Sharma, one of the team members of Art East. The intersection of art and storytelling is part of Indian art tradition. And these tellers of these tales were not only artists, but carriers of knowledge. So when we lose this art, we lose knowledge. Uh, they were institutions uh, in themselves. And the geography of such practice uh, was not contained in one area or region. It extended from the Patua painters and poet performers of Bengal, the Porto Chitra art of Odisha, uh, to the bards of Rajasthan's Fart Scroll, Garuda picture tellers in Gujarat, the Chitra Kartis of Maharashtra. The first time I um, was introduced to Porto Chitra was actually the you know, very um, cheap uh, copies of the Kaligharth pot. Uh, I did not, I had no idea that the Potra Chitra or the Potra Chitra at its, as it is pronounced in Odisha had such a long tradition. Festival collaborator Tete and I have tried to put together art traditions from folk to the contemporary that tell us a story. But I must uh, tell you that we couldn't have done this edition of Art East without Ritu Sethi. Ritu Sethi is the founder trustee of the Craft Revival Trust and the editor of Global INCH, the International Journal of Intangible Cultural Heritage. In addition, she oversees the Asia INCH Encyclopedia on Traditional Arts, Crafts, Textiles of South Asia. Ritu's research interests lie at the, inter lie at the intersects between history, culture, and crafts, examining the continuum of colonial to contemporary heritage. She has authored and edited several publications, including Embroidering Futures, Repurposing the Katha, Designers Meet Artisans, translated into Spanish and French, Painters, Poets, Performers, The Patuas of Bengal, among the other writings in Indian and international publications. Please pick up a copy of this from the India Foundation for Arts. Uh, uh, this was my uh, Bible to uh, try and put this festival together. And uh, Ritu today is going to tell us the intriguing tale of the Porto Chitro Patuas of Bengal and other concerns. It's such an intriguing name it's in itself, providing a background to the great lineage of pictorial storytelling in India. Ritu Sethi tracks the transformation of the evolving nature of this form by tracking the Patuas of Bengal. Uh, we may have a little problem with the internet bandwidth, uh, but uh, please bear with us. Um, Ritu should be joining us uh, as soon as she can get back her internet. But while she uh, is at it, let me read a little bit from her book. Uh, you can imagine that actually it's Ritu. Um, I mean, it's only going to be my voice because it's the language is Ritu's. Oh, here, yeah, here is Ritu. Ritu, uh, I was just about to start reading from your chapter, Tracing the Lineage, and there you are. 
So here's Ritu Sethi. Well, you may have to start again. You may have to start again. I seem to have a really dodgy internet connection. So I'm going to just jump straight into it because who knows when you'll have to start reading the book again. So. Uh, Well, I think I have to read the book again before she comes on. Please bear with us, dear audience. Um, these are the challenges of virtual living. Uh, we've gotten used to some of it. Um, most of the times we get it right. Sometimes we can't help it. Um, while she comes back again, let me tell you, this is uh, tracing the lineage, the lineage of, you know, uh, traditional art and the traditional folk storytelling. Uh, the intersection of art and narration of epics, fables, lore, and religious tenets has an enduring antiquity in India. Evidence from the third century BCE attests to this ancient telling of tales. So it's, it goes back to third century BCE. That's a, that's a long time. <laughs> telling tales through visual and narrative again. devices Sorry. that was central to the high and everyday arts and popular and folk customs. Okay, Ritu, over to you. Back again, sorry, sorry. So like I said, I'm gonna jump right in and my talk today is divided into three parts. The first is a brief background and I think Keshele has very kindly started reading from the book. The second is the intriguing case of the Patachitra, Patachitra Patwas of Bengal. And the third is some concerns about the future. So I'm going to share my screen now. Ma'am, please share and the screen again uh, because you logged off. We have lost that. Uh, can you please okay. press the share button again? OK, I will press the share button again. Yeah, OK, we can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Please go into the PowerPoint. Okay, I seem to have lost my own PowerPoint. Yeah. Can you see it now? Uh, yes, now we can. Okay, great. So please do uh, full screen, ma'am, so that it is visible okay. uh, if you can. Certainly, here you are, full screen. Okay. So on to the first, the intersection of art and the narration of epics, fables, lore, and religious tenets had, a, had an enduring antiquity in India. Over the ages, the arts of the painted storytelling introduced pilgrims to the basic tenets of their belief, communicated momentous events, and provided entertainment to the courts and the public. These tellers of tales were integral to the process of transmitting knowledge in ages of limited literacy, difficulties in travel, and communication. Evidence dating back from the 3rd century BCE attests to this method of telling tales and has been traced to the oldest extant theater in India, in the Sita Benga cave on the Ramgar hill in Jharkhand. This amphitheater holds an inscription on its wall, referring to it as a Lena Sobika, or a place for the performance of picture storytelling. Further architectural evidence is brought to bear from the magnificent remnants of the third century BCE Barhut Stupa in Satna and the great stupa in Sa at Sanchi dated to second century BCE. Its grand stands sandstone gateways positioned at cardinal points are surmounted by these dramatic slabs with sculpted scenes that indicate that include tales from the Buddhist Jataka. The furled ends culminating in worlds that give the impression of gigantic carved stone scrolls. This has led scholars to conjecture that these are monumental representations of the way in which picture storytelling was performed in ancient times. Other similar representations dot the landscape, 
attesting to not only a long and sophisticated and evolved tradition, but additionally to the geographic breadth of the custom. By the second century CE, pictorial storytelling was being expressed memorably through murals. The rhetoric with its vivid wealth of detail now translated onto walls as can be seen in the glorious murals in the rock cut monasteries of Ajanta, where the Jataka tales and episodes from the life of Lord Buddha were realized through these large scale paintings that see Siva Ramamurti, the great art historian, eloquently described as magnificent art galleries with the murals constituting an illustrative commentary on Buddhist literature. From the remnant traces of murals in the Buddhist rock cut cave situated in Bagh, Madhya Pradesh, dated to the 5th and 6th century, that were once extensively painted to the 7th century complex of frescoes at Sita Navasal in Padukotai district in Tamil Nadu, noted for its paintings, now sadly defaced. This con uh, custom continued well into the 16th century and beyond, with instances from the Matancheri Palace in Kochi to the murals executed in the Rang Mahal Palace in Chamba to the narrative wall paintings of the mid 16th century at Lipakshi, and to this really interesting reference in uh, Kizil, Central Asia, which actually shows a scroll being held up. Literary references were equally an important source to track the narration or pictorial storytelling. The fourth century Chitra Sutra of Vishnu Dharmotra Purana, the great treatise on painting and image making that sets out the ideals and theories stated even religious teachers use paintings as the most popular means of communication that could be understood by the illiterate and the child. In parallel, the popular everyday folk tradition had an equally long antiquity and fulfilled similar aims. The visual narratives integral not only to the process of transmitting knowledge, often of a religious nature, but equally for popular entertainment and educating audiences across the region. References to these itinerant picture narrators are found in several ancient texts. Patanjali in the Mahabhasya, written in second century BCE, using the historic present tense, speaks of the picture storytellers or Sobhikas, who through their pictures presented the legends of the Hindu god Krishna. Sobhikas again find mention in the Buddhist text Mahavastu, compiled between the 2nd century BCE and 4th century CE, where they are included among the other entertainers who flocked to see Lord Buddha in the city of Kapilavastu. Kautilya's treatise on statecraft, the Arthashastra, dated to around 3rd century CE, recognize the potential of entertainers as spies, moving freely as they did without arousing suspicion. In fact, he further recommended that trained spies could be disguised as actors and other public entertainers to better discharge their duties. Included in this list of entertainers were picture reciters, the Yamapatas, who narrated the punishments awaiting the wrongdoer in the next world from their painted scrolls. The narration of stories through scrolls was a long continuing tradition. As four centuries later, in the seventh century publication of Bana Bhatta's court biography, Harsha Charitra, provides a vivid portrayal of the Yama Patika again in a bazaar surrounded by excited children to whom he narrates the retribution awaiting sinners in the other world through a picture scroll. In the classical Sanskrit playwright's repertoire, the device of using the protagonist as a picture storyteller was a popular manner of introducing audiences to the backdrop of the story. This dramatic structure provided the context to the events that lay ahead. From the celebrated Sanskrit playwright 
Bhasa's fourth century classical drama, Dutta Vakyam, and continuing to Bhavabhuti's eighth century Sanskrit play, Uttara Ram Charitram. This trend continued till around the 10th century. This literary device, evidence of the picture storyteller's impact on society, cultural mores at large, and their staying power. The development and spread of paper making added on a more personalized form through the introduction of illustrated texts. And this intersection of art and the narrative tradition of storytelling reached a high apogee in the time of the great Mughal emperor Akbar in the 16th century. Brought up in a highly literate environment, Akbar himself, endowed with a brilliant intellect, was formally unlettered. His quest for knowledge reflected in the enormous outpourings of illustrated manuscripts from his huge artistic studios that he established. Their output was eclectic, mirroring the emperor's own interests. And the tradition of the oral recounting through illustrated pictures was an important part of routine, as attested by his biographer, Abul Fazal, in Aine Akbari. Among the many pictorial manuscripts was the dastane e mayir uh, Hamza. These fantastical tales of exploits of legendary heroes was captured in the spectacular Hamza Nama manuscript, comprising 1,400 folios, measuring two and a half feet by two feet. No two performers of these performances of these tales would have been the same, for it is almost certain that the renowned storytellers at court did not read verbatim the rather tersely described actions related in the text. Instead, they must have referred to them only as a narrative guideline, embellishing certain characters and situations as they dramatized the telling of the story. So just four centuries plus after the passing of Emperor Akbar, how do the picture storytellers fare today? Well, while we continue to love the combination of pictures and storytelling, as can be seen by rising subscriptions to Netflix, changing mores and new avatars of relating picture stories have decimated both the audience and the picture storytelling arts to obscurity. So we can only conjecture on the multitude of these itinerant pictorial storytelling traditions that have probably vanished over these centuries and in our very own time, unwritten about and unsung. Yet all is not lost, as there are some continuing traditions. And while my subject is the Patachitras of Bengal, there are other regional traditions that are informed by cultural contexts with distinct visual depictions and styles, with tales specific to communities or castes, some to be told at defined moments in time and other occasions too numerous to be specified, and told in languages and dialects that contain the teller within specific ge geographies. And I very rapidly just list a few. The first is a Pabuji Kaphat recital in Rajasthan which is an all-night liturgical narration by the itinerant kopa or priest performer. And it is accompanied by the depiction on a large horizontal painted cloth panel, the phad, which is dense with figures and events. We have the cherial scroll paintings of the Deccan. And these were painted across several villages till 1930s. And now we know of only one village where the painting continues. We have the Garoda scroll paintings of Gujarat, which were narrated by the itinerant priest, priest performer Bard, the Garoda who traveled and which has vanished in our own lifetime. In Maharashtra, we have the Chitrakati tradition, once found all over the state, but now again vanished in our lifetime. The Santhal Pats of Bengal, a tradition that extended across the habitats of tribal groups of the Santhals and the Bhumijis in Bengal, which were painted by the Jadu Patwas, literally magic scroll painters. These Pats uh, were of two main categories serving different purposes. The first 
being didactic, the theme specific to customs and beliefs. The second category, which you see on the right, was the Chakshudhan part, part of the death deliverance ritual of the Santhal people, which was painted on receiving news of the death of one of the Santhals. And it was painted by the Patwa in complete detail without the iris painted into the eye. And this represented the sightless wanderings in the afterlife. And after the ceremonial offering, the Jadu Patwa painted it in, the Chakshudhan, or bestowal of eyesight, brought peace to the restless wandering spirit. In some other continuing traditions, the telling of stories is accompanied by visual pictorial aids other than scrolls. From the cover, the portable shrines of Rajasthan with their box-like painted narratives with folding concertina doors, to the Matani Pachedi of Gujarat with its painted canopy and cloth hangings, the shadow puppets of Odisha, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Andhra are some of the others. And again in our lifetime, the Dayati leather puppet tradition of Maharashtra is no longer to be seen. So we move on now to our subject, the intriguing tale of the Patachitra Patwas of Bengal. In West Bengal, the community of Patwas or Chitrakars have traditionally been associated with the making of the Patachitra scroll, scroll paintings that they narrate before an audience through a story song, the Patgan. The Patwas continue to paint their scrolls, compose poetry, and sing their tale to audiences. Their inheritance continually negotiating between tradition and modernity. However, unlike the Garoda, Kavad, Phad, Chitrakati, the Deccani scrolls, whose stories were all narrated by clan priests to the communities they served, the Patwa's audiences were the villagers across the interiors of Bengal, different castes and different communities. From writings dating 1888 onwards and evidence of scrolls in museums and collections, it can be deduced that their subjects extended far beyond the Hindu epics and Purans and the regional Manglakavyas to the deeds of Muslim peers and to contemporary events, including revolts against the British Raj, major mishaps, ferry wrecks in the Hooghly, and other stories. In effect, they were pure and simple professional picture storytellers, very much the visual and narrative equivalent of a Netflix, as their telling of tales was suited to a wide audience with divergent interests. And this allowed them the license to relate tales of political, utilitarian, social, or didactic, while also fulfilling the needs of the religious to a Hindu, to a Muslim, or a tribal audience, but without the ritual, and of course, in a culturally appropriate manner. This remarkable ability that has its basis in the Patwa's historical past continues to hold good, hold, to hold them in good stead today, as can be seen by the interpretation of new ideas and events, incorporating the familiar with the new and making complex notions explicable this ability to make the unfamiliar less frightening, explaining it through perceptions, filtering ideas and events for their customary audiences, has been extended to educating rural communities in Bengal on various issues, including HIV AIDS prevention in the 1990s. And as Dr. Samiran Panda, who was working in Midnapur at that period stated, this cruel painting intervention made sense to me as a good public health tool. The art form is indigenous, culturally acceptable, and evokes a sincere interest in the community. Stating further, you get the information you need in a form you can hear and absorb. This adaptability has been unlike that of other picture storyteller telling communities whose themes were inherently linked to the religious domain. 
thus giving the Patuas a staying power that perhaps their compatriots in other traditions lacked. Moving effortly between the sacred and the secular space has not been an issue for the Patuas, reflected as it is in their dual identities, as they move seamlessly from personal religious beliefs to professional lives. Their complex social religious underpinnings lying as it does between the adherents to the two, to both the two major religions of the subcontinent and their ease of religious observance that serves the interest of both. In its quiet, non-strident manner, it could serve as a teaching on syncretism for many of us today. In other ways too, they were unlike other pictorial storytellers. From the Deccanese scrolls to the Kavar to the Fad, where the painters of the narrative scrolls and objects were not the reciters of tales, who were traditionally the clan priest. Just one example being that in the case of the Phad that are painted by members of the uh, Joshi community, while their recitation is by the Bhopa clan priest. Not only do the Patwa community paint their scrolls, they compose the lyrics of their chosen themes and perform it for their audiences. Therein lies their strength. And as in the past, the Patwa's independence in choosing their themes, whether utilitarian, social, from mythology, religion, folklore, politics, morality tales, or events of, the contempt of contemporary relevance, lies largely within their own control. This vigorous openness to ideas and themes the acceptance and adaptation to change is reflected among the women of their community and, the changing, and their changing roles. The near apocryphal account of their start is ascribed to a government Patachitra skill development workshop, where in order to receive the daily training stipend, the Patwa men send their wives and daughters to attend. From this modest beginning, that did not foretell the changes that would be wrought, started their active participation in making, performing, and marketing of scrolls. In addition, the dyna dynamism of the community of Patwas who work within the uh, tradition produces work that is not a pale repetitive uh, imitation of the past, but inscribed with vibrant expressions of a palpable creativity, whether it be work created for the bicentenary of the French Revolution, the cataclysmic events of 9-11, the Titanic movie celebrated in a scroll, the Asian tsunami, to now many, many scrolls on COVID. The rendering of the stories for children's publication, for making comics, they are building new traditions within the frameworks of the, of the old. But yet there are concerns. The impact and influence of government policies in post-independence India has actively influenced the development of everyday arts, including those of the Patwas. If we take a view of the strategic role of government, the implementation of development in initiatives through schemes was largely concentrated on product-centered craft development with trainings and skill development programs that enhanced earnings and improved access to markets. Through exhibitions, it brought them audiences beyond their own villages that encouraged them to expand their oeuvre beyond traditional material and markets, opening the floodgates with the art that was now expressed on paint, canvas, cloth, terracotta, wood, you name it. The painting and marketing, now a full-time home-based cottage industry for the whole family, with each member contributing to the family business. In addition, exposure to exhibitions and their own astute obs observation of the working of markets have resulted in some major shifts in the products available for sale. That besides cruel paintings, Kalighat pastiches, copies of Jadu Patwa scrolls and other objects 
jostle for space from umbrellas and t-shirts and mugs and pots and you name it. The story nar narration by the Patwa holding up a scroll provides a marketing draw in that adds a heightened sensory input to the sales pitch. As Radha Chitrakar commented, <coughs> when the sale of a painted t-shirt was going slow, we need a song for the t-shirts to draw in the buyers. Though there is no doubt that the commoditization of scroll paintings has allowed a certain economic security and also entrepreneurial as well as artistic freedom, on the flip side, it can be debated that this dynamic combination of commerce and culture has led to the unintended consequence of slowly but surely separating the tradition from its original impulse. By valuing the product and not its purpose, it has cut it off from its social and cultural underpinnings. The one fixed aspect in the past was that the art was inseparable from the narrative, the one not to be cleaved from the other. And there are many instances of this phenomena across the other narrative arts. The carver from its ritual telling, the puppet sold as objects, and the fad evaluated as a painting. For the patwas too, the transformative potential of the expanded domestic and international market has resulted in their putts, like other narrative art forms, being increasingly sold as a decorative item. So, as the patwas continue in an inexorable mediation with change, what lies ahead, given the grimness of a COVID present and a COVID future? Without sounding simplistic or sophist, perhaps one of the answers to the future continues to lie in the cultural geography of Bengal that revels in its rootedness, its regional myths, its celebration of the Bengali language through films, songs, literature, and the connectedness it gives Bangla speakers. With 60% of Bengal still located in its villages, the arts of the Patwa have great potential. As drawing strength from their historic past, the Patwa's proverbial adaptability to changing times and new audiences has always held them in good stead. Their ability to compose, perform, paint, transmit ideas, tell stories, and simplify complex situations to Bangla audiences will, I'm sure, continue to hold them in good stead in the future. Thank you. You know, I always uh, feel that the first first words that a child actually hears from its mother is a story. I mean, I think the story connects the human race, and uh, storytelling practice, therefore, is just uh, it's it's just part of uh, who we are. Uh, it, it's it's it identifies the human race rather than just uh, in regions and uh, communities. But I had a quick question to you, Ritu, is that uh, if you can uh, hear me, because I can't, uh, I think there, your visual has frozen for a moment, but we've survived the entire talk. I mean, you know, the entire talk went on without a glitch. Um, so, and while I, while Ritu returns, comes back to screen, and um, I ask Ritu the question, uh, members of the audience, please, uh, type your questions out and I will put them to Ritu. Uh, we have uh, some time, we have about 15, 20 minutes left and uh, I will put your questions there. Uh, so Ritu, the question that I had for you is that the Potuas, as you know, as, as we would pronounce it in Bengal, the A becomes O, was it a way of life for them or were they Paid. I mean, what was their livelihood then? And uh, because now we we want the patuas 
and the Potra Chitros to be sold in Delhi Hart and other craft melas, and that is the kind of livelihood that we look for them. But was what was their traditional livelihood? I'm not sure if you can hear me. So while you frame your questions, I would again rely on Ritu's own book that from where she was um, um, portions of which she was narrating to you um, and the last chapter which she touched upon was negotiating tradition negotiating modernity I mean it is a, it is a traditional it is a traditional craft it's a traditional craft but it's uh, I mean, how do we how do we present a potua or a potachetra in the modern context? In fact, one of the potachetra uh, painters, which is not exactly the kind of scroll painting that we are talking about in Bengal, but the potachetra in Orissa is slightly different. It appears on scrolls, but they don't open the scrolls to tell you a story. Is uh, one um, painter called Prakash Patra, and Prakash Patra uh, is from Bhubaneswar. And uh, his paintings are the paintings that you would see uh, in our virtual gallery if you take a tour. Uh, you must take a tour of the virtual gallery uh, on the, and that's available on the IIC website. Uh, that's uh, iicdelhi.in. And uh, in Prakash Patra's paintings, uh, you know, these are from mythology, these are birth of uh, Krishna. And uh, it has Shiva, it has Ganesh, uh, Shiva, Parvati, and Ganesh. And I was asking Prakash that, what do you, how do you paint? I mean, how do you, did you hear these stories? Do you read them up? I mean, what kind of research do you do? Because these are big paintings. They take a long time. They take about four to five people uh, to do these kind of paintings on cloth. Usually they do the painting with original, uh, with, with uh, organic uh, color. And he said that these are, these are general stories that they would have heard at home. So these are not, you know, researched stories. And uh, I mean, that's the beauty of folklore, I suppose. It's like the it's like the blues. Uh, so you know, each each performer, each practitioner would sing it or would tell it in their own style, in their own way. There, there's their various versions, and uh, that makes such a fascinating story about uh, the folk culture across India and across South Asia because you see the same story repeating in various forms in different parts. Um, so in negotiating tradition, negotiating modernity, Ritu says that in their increasingly complex theater of operations, the potuas are in an in inexorable meditation or mediation with change. Their artistic inheritance continually negotiating between tradition and modernity. Ritu, you're back. I had a question for you, Ritu, that what did the potuas <laughs> that's okay i mean Sorry, you know, the, your talk no no the talk went off without a glitch um we are negotiating we are negotiating a virtual life so we'll negotiate uh, and we'll navigate it um the way it happens uh, i was asking ritu is that did the potuas have a lifestyle where they moved from place to place telling stories what was their livelihood option in earlier days and what are their livelihood options now? Sorry, can't hear you. Could you hear, can you hear me now, Ritu? Can you hear me now? Connection, this no. is, I think, what? an evening straight out of here. Straight, uh, slowly straight for the Yama Patakas. Yeah, you are. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I was asking what what, what is the what was the livelihood pattern of Fatwa's early in the early days? Ritu ma'am, you can do one thing, you can stop your camera. There is an option to stop your camera. Okay, I'll stop my camera. Sure, I'll stop so my camera. There. Is that now better? You can, now, yeah, okay. yeah, now can we you can hear you. Me? Please go on. Okay. Uh, yes. I, I think, Keshara, I uh, heard a bit of your yeah. 
I heard a bit of your question, which was about the livelihood pattern. Am I right? No, I was asking about the livelihood pattern. Can you still hear me? Of, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Ritu? Yes, I can hear you. Well, uh, earlier and even mm -hmm. now, uh, when they travel from village to village uh, and Sorry, well, I, I think, think this are, is. Yeah, yeah gonna, okay. We'll <laughs> take another, make another, make another attempt <laughs> to uh, telling the story. I would uh, wait a little while for Ritu to come back, but uh, you know. Um, Really sorry, uh, members of the audience. Uh, if you can type your questions, uh, uh, because the main presentation is over, we will wrap up now and try and see if any question can uh, be answered. But uh, I don't think so, Ritu's uh, uh, network is holding, really. And uh, the I'll read a little bit, and then we will probably wrap up the session today. Um, Send in your questions and queries, and um, we'll have Ritu to reply to those uh, later, and we'll send it back to you. Um, you can log into um, to, to, to the IIC website, or you could even log into the Art East website, which is arteastfestival.com. Um, and tomorrow, uh, we have another session uh, coming straight out of Nagaland. In Nagaland, uh, there is a, I mean, you know, many of you, and because it's such a popular textile, the Naga shawl. Now, you would have seen motifs on the Naga shawl. Now, that's also a form of storytelling. And um, there would be um, Santila Yanger, who will be actually uh, one of the finest uh, experts uh, in Nagaland and across India on the Naga textiles. Uh, she will be um, delivering a talk, an illustrative talk at uh, 4 p.m. tomorrow, India uh, time. So please join us tomorrow. Um, we hope to have better network then. Um, I'm really sorry, apologies for, uh, for this network, but I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, send us your uh, feedback. And if I can read this last bit, the concluding part of the book by Ritu, which probably would have been her conclusion, is Back to the Future. That was a chapter which she was reading out. As we laud radical developments in contemporary arts, we must do the same for traditional uh, contemporary. And in artists this time, you would have seen traditional contemporary. So we have the Porto Chitra, as well as we have photo collages, uh, and we have illustrations. Um, we have um, video installations. Uh, and these are forms of storytelling. They use different media tools to tell stories. On the one hand, without sounding simplistic or sophist, as she said, and I'm repeating out here, her out here, perhaps one of the answers to the future continues to lie in the cultural geography of Bengal that revels in its rootedness, its regional myths, its celebration of the Bengali language through films, songs, literature, and the connectedness it gives Bangla speakers. 60% of uh, Bengal still lives in its villages. Um, and the arts of the Patua have great potential that would continue to be harnessed in the developing world. I mean, as she showed uh, you that photo chitra of HIV, I mean, there are several, uh, you know, in, 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 in particularly in Bengal, the, the, the events in Bengal have been depicted by Potua, and the interesting uh, events that were depicted were revolutions like the Santhal, Indigo, Sipoi mutiny. They're prominently featured in the Potua scroll and songs. Uh, and, um, you know, the question that um, Commander K.K. Varma has asked, uh, I will pass that on to uh, Ritu and uh, try and um, send you her reply. Um, but uh, I'm not sure uh, that, you know, they have got converted to any religion, but irrespective of that, they uh, fall back and they refer to uh, largely to Indian mythology um, or, the, you know, Hindu mythology as you, one would call it 
without ascribing religion. Their ability to compose, perform, and paint. I mean, I think they, that's pretty incredible. They compose, they perform, and they paint. So, you know, they do a, they, 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 uh, they do a lot of things together. And they transmit the ideas and simplify complex situations to the audience. And that forms a powerful form of teaching, learning, and communication. Um, while on the other hand, with the major cultural and technological transformations that are occurring, we must include the impact of education, the exposure to travel, and digital technologies, as well as the numerous images and other influences circulating online. The advent of new and continuing of traditional avenues may lead to a new future for the Potuas as they continue their work and travels grappling with their many worlds, multiple identities, and simultaneous modernities in these changing times. What is also worrying, and one of the reasons why we started this uh, festival and why we continue uh, organizing this festival is that uh, the world is going through a tremendous uh, phase of migration. People are migrating due to various reasons. So these itinerant poet performers of the villages of Bengal and, of course, various other parts of the country, uh, from Rajasthan to Telangana, from Odisha to Nagaland, they are moving away from the villages. And along with that, this storytelling practice is dying um, or is actually, you know, is, is threatened. So this is our little attempt to try and understand, reinterpret and celebrate the art of storytelling. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow at 4 p.m. on the same, same place, same time. Good night and good luck.